Hey everyone, in this video, I'm going to be breaking down Fables Volume 3, Storybook Love. This is a very long one. It spans eight issues, and it's going to cover a few story arcs. We're going to have two one-shots in here, a one two-parter and one four-parter. And honestly, all the individual stories, I think, are pretty great. So I think we're in for a good time. Now, in Volume 1, we were introduced to the New York City Fables, and in Volume 2, we were introduced to all the various animal fables, and now with everything established, we can really go some places in Volume 3. So let's dive into it now. Volume 3 of Fables. Fables Volume 3, written by Bill Willingham, art by Mark Buckingham, Lan Medina, Brian Talbot, and Linda Medley. Fables Issue 11, Bag o' Bones, in which death itself proves to be just another occasion for Jack to hatch his schemes. This issue takes place during the American Civil War, so sometime between 1861 and 1865. It is a one-off tale about Jack Horner during the Civil War. When the Civil War kicked off, Jack hoped he could marry himself a rich Southern belle. First, though, he would put on a fake Southern accent, and then he would join the Southern Army and gain some renown in battle, and then, with that renown, he would use it to impress some southern bells and get himself a rich wife. However, things did not work out exactly how Jack wanted, and he soon realized he was on the losing side of the war, so he left. He started walking home. He brought all sorts of food and supplies for his journey. Jack, he cut through a swamp, and in that swamp, he met a man named Nick Slick, who is secretly the devil himself. Nick Slick asked Jack if he wanted to play some cards, some poker. Jack said sure. Then the two men, they gambled, and Jack, he slowly lost everything he had, including the shirt off his back. And every time Nick Slick won, he would put all the items he won off Jack inside a magical sack. And the magical sack seemed to have an endless amount of room. Nick Slick, he wanted to keep on playing. Eventually, he asked Jack if Jack would like to play one last hand, except this time they would be gambling for Jack's soul. Jack was annoyed, he says, so that's what this is all about. I should have recognized you right off, Mr. Slick. Where's your horns and tail and cloved hooves? Nick tells Jack to stick to the subject. Are they going to play one more hand or not? Jack, he agrees to play. Jack says that he wants to deal the cards, though, and if he wins, he wants to take everything, including Nick Slick's magical sack there, too. Nick, he accepts the wager, and Jack, he deals the cards out. After the poker hands are played, Nick Slick has an ace-high flush, a very good hand, but Jack dealt himself four jacks, four of a kind, which wins. Nick Slick is angry. He jumps up and down and says, Dang it! You tricked me somehow! And Jack replies, Nonsense! Who could trick the devil himself? Jack, he left Nick Slick with the magical sack in tow. Nick never could figure out how he was outfoxed by Jack, but at the end of the day, they were both cheaters and Jack was just the better one. Jack, he was known to boast at times when he was deep into his cups that he never did pick up a deck of cards where he couldn't deal himself all four Jacks whenever he liked. So, Jack he won that match, and as Jack is walking, he comes across a pig. Jack says the magic words that make the magic sack work. Jack says to the pig, Clickety-clack, get into my sack. And the pig gets sucked into the magical sack. Jack, he's planning on eating that pig later. Jack, he keeps walking, and he comes across a very nice southern house with many chickens and farm animals running about. Jack, he sucks up some of those chickens into his sack, and then he enters the house. Jack inside the very nice house is yelling out, Hello! And he asks if anyone is there. Eventually, he finds a beautiful woman held up in her bedroom, bedridden. She introduces herself to Jack as Sally Cornwallis. Sally is very beautiful and very nice. She is a proper lady. But she explains that all of her family has died of illness, and soon she will die too. She thinks she only has a few hours left. She tells Jack not to worry though. Her illness is not contagious. After they talk for a while, Jack asks her, Hey, I uh, 
Don't suppose you'd want to have one last tumble first before the Reaper comes to take you? I ain't had a woman in three years, not counting whores, of course. And since you have no plans this afternoon, you know, I thought... Sally, she is offended by this. She is a proper lady. She intends to go virtuous to her lord. She tells Jack that his accent sounds fake. He ain't no southern gentleman. Jack, he asks her, what if he could uh, keep the devil from claiming her? Sally, she starts crying. She says that Jack has been cruel. No one has that power to save her life. Jack says he's serious. Does she want to live? What prize would she pay to escape death today? Sally says, well, anything, of course. Jack says, then deal. Sit tight, Sally, and let me do everything. And afterwards, remember our deal. I haven't had a woman in a long time and never one as pretty as you. So eventually, death comes. The Grim Reaper himself, along with his scythe. Death has come to claim Sally. Jack is waiting, though, and he has his magical sack, and he says, Mr. Rattlebones, I've got you now. Clickety-clack, get in my sack. And Death gets sucked into Jack's magical sack. Immediately, Sally feels better. Her paralysis is gone. She is no longer bedridden. Jack has captured Death himself. Jack tells Sally, now you remember our deal. Time to claim my hero's reward. Sally is thankful that she is alive, although she doesn't really want to sleep with Jack, but she will fulfill her end of the bargain. She tells Jack to bathe first, though. Jack, he does so, and then the two of them get it on. And Sally, she really lets her ambitions loose. She wants to keep going again and again and again. And in the morning, she asks Jack to go once again. Jack tells her, though, that he needs energy. He tells her to make him some breakfast first. He says, go slaughter something. I'll need to replenish everything you've taken out of me. Go on. So Sally, she goes outside to kill one of those chickens that was on her property. She cuts the chicken's head off, but the chicken stays alive as, remember, death is trapped in Jack's sack so nothing can die. Sally, she eventually brings Jack outside and shows him that none of the animals she tried to kill have died. And we see all the animals are gory and bloody, but they are still standing, all of them still alive. Eventually, some Confederate soldiers that should clearly be dead, but are somehow still alive, well, they arrive too. And they ask Jack, what has he done? They say, we were killed in battle this morning, Jack, but we can't die. Why have you kept us from going to our reward? Jack, he eventually figures out that he has to undo this. So he gets his sack and releases Death from it. When Death is released from the sack, Death is confused. Death asks Jack, how did you do that to me? And Jack answered, now don't get angry, sir. I can explain everything. On the contrary, though, Death is not angry. Death is actually ecstatic. He says, angry? Why would I be angry? That was the first day off I've had. It was wonderful. I feel so rested. Jack asks, so, uh, is everything okay between the two of us? And Death answers, yes, as long as you let me take a day off in your magic bag once every year or so. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have some work to catch up on. Sally Cornwallis asks, what about her? Death says, uh, he'll give the two of them another year together. That's the best he can do, but then he's going to come back for her. A few weeks after that, Sally eventually ran off from Jack with a traveling preacher and a whiskey drummer. And Jack, he also lost his magic bag. What happened to that magic bag? Well, that is a story for another day. Fables, Issue 12 A Sharp Operation, Part 1 of a Two-Part Caper Back to the current day now. Bigby has a meeting with Briar Rose, a.k.a. Sleeping Beauty. Anytime Sleeping Beauty pricks her finger and draws blood, she falls asleep. But she also causes everyone else around her to fall asleep, too. And a thorn forest will start growing around whatever building she happens to be in. When she has fallen asleep, she can only be awakened by the true love kiss of a prince. Well, Sleeping Beauty had an incident recently. She was at Tiffany's, the jewelry store, and she pricked her finger on a diamond pin. 
and drew blood, and she fell asleep, and the whole store fell asleep with her. Luckily that time, the Mundys thought that it was just some kind of gas leak. But this stuff can't keep happening, and this is why she was having this meeting with Bigby. Bigby tells Briar Rose that she's got to wear some gloves or something and get this situation under control because this cannot keep happening. Little Boy Blue interrupts Bigby's meeting and tells him that a Monday gentleman is by the gate, asking for Bigby personally. Before we continue on with Bigby, we jump somewhere else in the city. Prince Charming is being tossed out of the apartment of the latest Monday girl he was shacking up with. The girl wants him out. Prince Charming was expecting this. This is a usual occurrence for him. He tells the girl, I'm already two steps ahead of you, Molly dear. While you were sleeping, I set my luggage into storage. If nothing else, over the years, I've learned to anticipate when a romance has run its natural course. Remember Molly Greenbaum, whom was the woman we saw Prince Charming hooking up with in Volume 1? Well, Prince Charming called this girl Molly. And well... This girl is not Molly. The girl responds, Molly? Who's Molly? Prince Charming to this says, Oops, slip of the tongue. I have to confess, I can never remember which pretty lady girl I'm bunking with these days. Which one are you again? Are you Daphne or Trish? The girl tells Charming, I knew it. I knew you were sneaking other women in here while I was out. And I know you've been stealing money from me too. Prince Charming, he leaves and admits, Yes, I am a terrible cad. You take care now, whoever you are. Back over to Bigby in Fable Town. He meets with the mysterious Monday man who asks for him by name. The man is named Tommy Sharp, and he is an investigative journalist. Tommy tells Bigby that for the past several years, he has been working on a story about Bigby's underground community here. He has hours of research, pictures, documentation. He says he knows their secrets. Tommy asks for Bigby to respond before his story publishes. Bigby, he plays aloof, not saying anything. Tommy continues explaining. He says, in any case, you've each been alive here for centuries, tucked away in this quiet little corner of the city. Your group has owned everything on this block since back when New York was still called New Amsterdam. I've got records. I've compiled personal histories. I've dug up pictures of a number of you dating back to the very beginning of photographic technology. And not one of you has aged a day. Bigby tells Tommy, So let me guess. This story of yours is going to be published between the Big Elvis is an Alien expose and the latest installment of I Had Goat Boy's Love Child. Tommy, he says to Bigby, Mock me if you like. But we both know I'm going to win the Pulitzer Prize with this. Maybe even the Nobel Prize for being the first to come up with unimpeachable proof of the existence of your kind. Bigby asks the man, it just what do you imagine my kind is? Tommy, he says, why, vampires, of course. Bigby smiles. You can't believe Tommy is serious. He's so wrong. Tommy, he explains further and says, A group of immortals with fantastic powers, passing themselves off as normal humans. I've read Anne Rice. I've seen the movies. It all fits. He also says that one day he followed Bigby and saw Bigby turn into an animal in Central Park and go for a midnight run. Bigby, he just tells Tommy that he is insane. Tommy replies, Play it that way if you insist but you don't have long to get your side of the story on record before I publish. Tommy gives Bigby his business card. Later that day, Bigby calls a meeting with Bluebeard, Boy Blue, Flycatcher, and Jack Horner. Buffkin is also there flying around. Snow White would have been invited too, but Bigby left her out of it because she is still recovering from being shot in the head last volume. Also, this may require some dirty business, so he would rather keep her out of it. Bigby explains to the group all about this Tommy Sharp, the investigative reporter with this vampire theory. Bigby says if his story gets published, their life here is effectively over. Sure, no one official would ever believe the story of them being vampires, but 
Enough Mundy kooks and goth freak wannabe vampires would, and it would kind of ruin their life. Bluebeard suggests that they should just kill this guy. Maybe if it was a hundred years ago, Bigby would go along with that plan, but Bigby says they can't do that. It's the information age. This Tommy Sharp character is too well known. His story might still come out. Bigby instead comes up with a different kind of scheme. It will require Jack Horner's computer skills and Sleeping Beauty, too. Before they head out on this scheme, Bluebeard has a private meeting with Jack Horner, and Bluebeard gives Jack a gun. He tells Jack that if they can't solve this situation Bigby's way, the two of them need to be ready to step it up with deadly force. Bigby and his crew, along with Sleeping Beauty and Prince Charming, arrive at the apartment complex of Tommy Sharp. Prince Charming and Sleeping Beauty enter the lobby, making up a story that they are there for a party. The concierge buys it. Prince Charming, he steps outside saying he forgot something in the car. And then Sleeping Beauty, inside the lobby, pricks her finger and draws blood. And she falls asleep. And shortly after, everyone in the entire building falls asleep. We see many of them dozing in their various apartments. Bigby and his crew wait outside the apartment complex for about an hour. They have to wait outside because if they go in too early, they will fall asleep too from Sleeping Beauty's sleeping power. While waiting, Jack and Bigby discuss vampires. Jack Horner comments, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we were vampires, we'd all be rich. Bigby asks, how? Jack answers, think it through. Vampires make more vampires just by sucking people's blood, right? Do you know how much these Mondays would pay to someone who could make them immortal? Jack, he then thinks on it for a while, and then a light bulb goes up in his head. He comes up with some sort of money-making scheme. Big B stops him, though, and says, forget it. Jack asks, forget what? Big B says, you just realized you could make use of the same old pictures of yourself and the rest of us that Tommy Sharp here found to convince gullible rich Mondays that you're a vampire and cheat them out of their money by promising to make them immortal. I'm way ahead of you, Jack. I always will be. After all these years, I know how your mind works. You try it, and I'll lock you up for a century. Jack is disappointed that Big B stopped his brilliant money-making scheme at its beginning. Anyway, it is time now to go inside the apartment complex. Prince Charming checks in on Sleeping Beauty, and Flycatcher and Bluebeard guard the entrance. Meanwhile, Big B, Boy Blue, and Jack Horner go upstairs to Tommy Sharp's apartment. They all look around and try to find any evidence on them. As they search the apartment, they eventually find Tommy Sharp asleep on the toilet from Sleeping Beauty's sleeping effect. Jack, he goes on Tommy's computer, and he starts to see if he can find anything there. Meanwhile, Bigby and Boy Blue look around. After a while, they finish their searching of the apartment. Boy Blue managed to gather all the physical evidence that Tommy acquired on them. Jack tells the group, though, that he has some bad news. He looked on Tommy's computer, and Tommy appeared to have backed up all of his files remotely on the internet, on places that Jack can't go. Maybe if they hired a really good computer hacker and gave the hacker a week or more, he'd be able to get them, but for now, they're kind of out of luck. Jack says, though, he has another plan. He says, it depends, though, on how evil you're prepared to get. Fables, issue 13, Dirty Business, part two of a two-part caper. Bluebeard eventually joins the others upstairs in Tommy's apartment. Bluebeard, holding a gun, says that they should just kill Tommy. Bigby tells Bluebeard to back off. He says, you kill him, I kill you. Bigby, he wants to try out Jack Horner's plan with dealing with all this. Before they can carry it out, though, Bigby and Bluebeard have words. Bluebeard asks, when did you get so tame? Bigby says to not push this any further. Bluebeard does not care about Bigby's threats. He tells Bigby, Your constant or else's have grown tedious. Hasn't anyone ever told you that threats lose their impact when so often repeated without ever actually acting on one of them? 
Bigby has had enough of Bluebeard's shit. He tells him, I haven't needed to act because you've always backed down and always will. Sure, you're a terror when gunning unarmed brides on their wedding night or gunning down an unconscious man on a toilet. You're a coward, Bluebeard, hiding behind a lifetime of wealth and privilege. Now, unless you're prepared to throw down... Bigby and Bluebeard then stare each other down. But in the end, Bigby knows that Bluebeard is not prepared to back up his words with a fight. Bigby turns and says, I thought so, tough guy. When you get done pissing yourself with fear, tuck tail and do what I told you to do. Obey me. Bluebeard, he leaves. And surprisingly, he gets emotional when he gets outside. He sheds a single tear. The big, tough Bluebeard, killer of several wives, is a little bit of a bitch when he gets confronted by Bigby. Anyway, Bigby and crew grab all the physical evidence in Tommy Sharp's apartment, and they grab Tommy himself and take him with them. They also carry Sleeping Beauty, who is still asleep, outside of Tommy Sharp's apartment. Thorns are continuing to grow outside, due to Sleeping Beauty's sleeping effect. Bigby tells Flycatcher to assemble a crew and come back here and get rid of these thorns before they continue to grow. On the car ride back to the Woodland Estates, Bigby tells Grimble, the security guard, to find Pinocchio and get him for me. It is urgent. When they get back to the Woodland Luxury Apartments, Bluebeard goes back to his apartment and he has his manservant, Hobbs, give him a bath. During his bath, Bluebeard is complaining about Bigby. He says that Bigby is a predatory mongrel beast and he won't stand for him any longer. Bluebeard says he is going to remove Bigby once and for all. He is planning on killing him. Now over to Sleeping Beauty's apartment. Sleeping Beauty is still asleep. She must be kissed by a prince who loves her with true love. Prince Charming, he goes to kiss her to wake her up. He used to be married with her back in the day. But when he kisses her, nothing happens. It doesn't work. Prince Charming realizes that it is because he doesn't truly love her. When he was first chasing her, he loved her, but that love faded once he had to actually, you know, get down to the business of living with her. Prince Charming comments, I'm just no damned good at the happily ever after. Flycatcher says that he could try kissing her, he is a prince after all. Remember, he is the frog prince. Flycatcher says he may not be handsome, but he is a prince. And he is awfully fond of Miss Briar here. He gives her a smooch on her mouth, and it works. Sleeping Beauty wakes up. Although when she wakes up, she comments, What happened? How did it all turn out? And why does my mouth taste like bugs? Well, now it is time to deal with Tommy Sharp. Pinocchio, who is a real boy now, is with Jack Horner and they are waiting outside the cell where Tommy Sharp is stuck in. Bigby inside of the cell is talking to Tommy. Bigby lies and tells Tommy that, yes, Tommy was right, they actually are all vampires, and they bit him and drank his blood. Not enough to change him into one of them, but enough so that they can track and control him if they want. They tell Tommy that, if he ever publishes that story on them, they will control him and make him kill himself and do all sorts of horrible stuff. Not only that, they will destroy his reputation too. When Tommy was asleep, they made him pose in compromising pictures with Pinocchio, who remember looks like a little boy. Bigby shows Tommy the photos and Bigby tells Tommy, That little boy in the pictures with you is one of us, immortal. Over three centuries old, but he looks no more than eight or nine, especially with the way we dress him up. Tommy, he starts crying. They can ruin him with these photos. He says that he never did this. He couldn't have. Bigby says that they also have Pinocchio on tape talking to a child psychologist about all the places that Tommy touched him. Bigby says that the boy is very convincing. Tommy asks... What do they want him to do? He'll do anything. Bigby replies, Do nothing. Go back to your life and forget all about us forever. 
Make sure no one ever finds out about us, even after your natural death, if you care about how you're remembered. Bigby then has Jack Horner take Tommy to his home. Well, they got Tommy good. Tommy will not be a problem anymore. At that moment, Prince Charming is in Briar Rose's, aka Sleeping Beauty's, apartment. He loves how rich she is, and how nice her place is. Her place is downright palatial. Prince Charming, he then talks with Briar Rose, who is now awake. He says that he's going to stay here to look after her. Briar Rose is confused about this change in Prince Charming, and why is he being nice to her? Prince Charming is now being extra nice to Briar Rose because, well, we have a little flashback. Back to when all the crew was at Tommy Sharp's apartment earlier. Prince Charming was talking to Flycatcher in the apartment lobby, and they were both admiring how beautiful Briar Rose was. Charming commented, She always did look her best when she was sleeping. Flycatcher replied, She is really pretty, Mr. Charming, and rich, too. That always helps. Prince Charming was a little bit confused and shocked. He asked, Seriously? Briar Rose got out with her fortune intact? I never heard that. Flycatcher then explains, Nah, she showed up here as poor as the rest of us, but that didn't last long. Remember back in the homelands all those fairy blessings she got on her christening day? One of them was that she'd always be wealthy. Well, within a year of arriving here, she made a killing in the stock market. Big magic, you know. If she gave all of her money away today, she'd probably win the lottery tomorrow. Well, damn, Prince Charming did not know she was so well off. All of a sudden, he's very interested in Briar Rose again. Especially after his most recent girl he was hooking up with kicked him out. Well, Prince Charming talking to Briar Rose right now is being very charming to her. He says that, you know what? He was a bad, unfit husband earlier, but he seeks Briar Rose's forgiveness. And he offers to stay here in her place as penance for his past deeds. He says he will not be with her romantically, though, but platonically. He'll stay in one of the other rooms and take care of her and see her through her various sleeping spells, even if it takes months or years or decades as long as it takes to work off his debt to her. Briar Rose is not fully trusting of Prince Charming, but she eventually accepts his offer to take care of her. Days pass, and Briar Rose is talking to Bigby, and they are recapping all of the events. Bigby is surprised to learn that she is allowing Prince Charming to move back in with her. She explains it's not like that. It's not romantic. He's staying in the guest bedroom. Briar Rose, she then steers the conversation away from that subject. She asks Bigby, why is she here now? And Bigby, he asks about the incident in Tiffany's, the one that they were talking about at the beginning of last issue, when Sleeping Beauty pricked her hand on a diamond pin and the whole store fell asleep, including herself. Bigby asks, how did she end up waking up that time? And Briar Rose admits a little embarrassingly, one of the, um policeman who responded to the situation he had a police dog a very affectionate police dog and i woke up to him lapping at my face bigby laughs he says <laughs> and don't tell me the dog's name was prince turns out it was and briar rose says to bigby repeat any of this and i'll hate you forever elsewhere bluebeard meets with tommy sharp in central park tommy is there as bluebeard demanded that he show up tommy he is still so scared of the fables releasing information on him that he is doing anything they ask. Bluebeard, he asks about all the files and evidence that Tommy had, and Tommy answers, It's destroyed, all of it. No notes, no traces, nothing. You can search me or my place anywhere you like. Bluebeard responds, Oh, that won't be necessary, Thomas. I believe you. And we'll all sleep more comfortably at night without that ugly business hanging over our heads any longer. Bluebeard, he then pulls out a gun and shoots and kills Tommy. And then he walks away. Tommy, he was successfully blackmailed, and he most likely was going to stay quiet forever. But Bluebeard, he wanted things done his way, and he resented the fact that Bigby vetoed his idea and plan to kill Tommy earlier. So Bluebeard, even though everything was already wrapped up, 
decided he was going to kill Tommy now, anyway. Fables, Issue 14, Storybook Love, Part 1 of 4, The Mouse Police Never Sleep. We see a little man riding a mouse. His name is Sergeant Wilfred, and his mouse partner is named Corporal Rex. These two normally live up on the farm in a village called Small Town, where everybody is very small. However, right now they are down in the city, and they are doing some investigative work in Fable Town inside Bluebeard's apartment, as part of some sort of espionage mission. While they are investigating Bluebeard's place, where is Bluebeard? Well, over at Edmund Dante's fencing studio, he is a character from the Count of Monte Cristo, by the way. Well, at that fencing studio, Bluebeard is there, and he is competing in a friendly match against Prince Charming, the purpose of which is to educate Edmund Dante's fencing students. Back at Bluebeard's apartment, Sergeant Wilfred and Corporal Rex discover Bluebeard's diary and they give it a read. Elsewhere in Fable Town, Bigby and Boy Blue are walking with Snow White, who is now able to occasionally walk herself with the help of crutches and is not fully wheelchair bound anymore. Elsewhere on the farm, Rose Red gets a call from Jack Horner. Jack, he says he wants to come up to the farm and see her. Rose turns Jack down, though. She says the two of them are no longer together anymore. And she says, Jack, he wasn't a very good boyfriend anyway. Rose was just with Jack because it annoyed her sister. But Rose's life is no longer just about annoying Snow White. Rose Red, she is really thriving up on the farm, really getting things done and embracing her new role. Back over to the fencing studio. Bluebeard, he eventually wins his friendly fencing match against Prince Charming. He easily wins, winning five to nothing. Afterwards, Bluebeard heads with his butler Hobbs, who is usually in hobgoblin form, but is right now wearing a glamour to look human out in public. Well, the two of them, they begin heading home. Later on in the day, once Bluebeard eventually arrives home in his apartment, we see he is having a romantic affair with Goldilocks. Goldilocks is a wanted fugitive in Fable Town for her part in being a ringleader of the revolutionaries up at the farm. She's also wanted for the attempted assassination of Snow White. Bluebeard, he has been letting her live in his place secretly for months. Goldilocks appreciates him letting her stay here, but she says she is growing bored and she wants to get out. While they are talking, the Mouse Police Investigators, Sergeant Wilford and Corporal Rex, are hiding. They are watching from above, spying. They know that Goldilocks is a wanted fugitive, and they say they need to report this immediately. Wilford and Corporal Rex try to discreetly sneak out of the apartment without being seen, but Goldilocks spots them. She chases after them in her underwear. Sergeant Wilford and Corporal Rex are running as fast as they can. But Goldilocks grabs an axe off the wall. She swings it at them, but she misses. Wilfred and Corporal Rex are nearing the door. But Corporal Rex gets a knife thrown right through his body. Corporal Rex's dying words to his partner are, Get out of here, boss. I'm done for. Do your damn duty. Sergeant Wilfred, he manages to escape out the door. Bluebeard, Goldilocks, and Hobbs investigate the dead mouse body and they realize that they might get reported on very soon to Bigby and Snow White. Bluebeard has a plan, though. Bluebeard, he goes to visit Snow White and Bigby immediately. He wanted to get to them before they would even have the opportunity to hear that he was harboring Goldilocks. Bluebeard's cover story is that he is ratting Jack Horner out for something that Jack did. Bluebeard tells Snow and Bigby, Jack, he tried to sell me this last night. He claims it's highly magical and he can supply a case to them. Bluebeard, he shows them some sort of potion and he opens it in front of them. The potion then releases some sort of gas in the air. It is a trance enchantment spell. It will put Bigby and Snow into a trance and Bluebeard will be able to influence them. 
under the influence of the magic potion. He gives them some orders. He orders them to go on a vacation over the next few days, the two of them together, somewhere secluded out of town, somewhere where no one can reach them. He also makes it that the two of them will not be able to recognize Goldilocks if they see her. Bluebeard's plan is to then send Goldilocks on after them and get her to kill them both. Bluebeard he also makes it that if somehow Bigby and Snow White do survive and the spell wears off, that they will just believe Jack Horner was somehow responsible. Immediately after that interaction with Bluebeard, Snow White goes and talks with King Cole. She tells King Cole that she's going on vacation, she says. I must have several hundred vacation days saved up by now. King Cole is a little confused, he asks. Well, uh, yes, but uh, you never take vacations. This is, um, unexpected. Where do you plan to go? Snow answered, I'm not sure. Maybe I'll try the tables in Las Vegas or lie on the beach in Cancun. No, better yet, somewhere no phones can reach me. Maybe I'll go camping somewhere far and remote. Snow, she also adds that, oh, and Bigby's going with her. It turns out that they desperately want to go away together. This really confuses King Cole. Since when does Snow White like Bigby that much? And why would they go on vacation together? It's unorthodox, but he is not going to deny Snow White a much needed vacation. This is all part of Bluebeard's plan. With Bigby and Snow White on this vacation together somewhere secluded, Bluebeard, he then sends Goldilocks to go on after them. He bought her a very strong and expensive glamour that will hide her appearance. And thanks to his spells that he put Snow and Bigby under, they won't even be allowed to recognize her, at least for a few days once the trance spell will wear off. Bluebeard, he wants Goldilocks to kill both Snow and Bigby together, away from civilization, and make sure that their bodies will never be found. Fables, Issue 15, Storybook Love, Part 2, Into the Woods. Bigby and Snow White, entranced by the spell, took a plane to Seattle. Once there, they traveled out into the woods and went camping. It wasn't until two or three days later did they finally come to their senses and the spell's effects wore off. When it finally did wear off, Bigby and Snow White had no clue where they were, or why they were camping, and why were they in a tent together? Why are they in the forest? How did they get here? They eventually found their plane ticket stub, so they know that they took a plane here. They also find a receipt from an outfitter equipment store for all the clothes and supplies they have on. Snow White, confused, asks, So we flew out here with nothing, not even luggage, and decided on a lark to go camping? Together? Bigby eventually deduces that they must have been put under some sort of trance enchantment spell that compelled them to do this. Bigby, he assumes Jack Horner is behind it, thinking that he was probably pranking them. While Snow and Bigby are trying to figure things out, meanwhile up at Fable Town, some of these small town tiny people investigators have been caught spying around Fable Town. So far, three of them have been caught. Sergeant Wilfred, though, the one that was with Corporal Rex and knows all the secrets about Bluebeard harboring Goldilocks, is still missing in action. We see that he has run into some Mundy rats, real rats, and they are curious about him and he is having to fight them off. Boy Blue, Bluebeard, and Prince Charming are discussing what they should do with these small town spies they have captured. None of these small town people are talking. Bluebeard, he calls for an immediate investigation. Prince Charming, though, he is the one that is put in charge of handling this investigation per orders of King Cole himself. King Cole chose Prince Charming because of how Prince Charming successfully conducted the war trials up at the farm in Volume 2. Bluebeard is annoyed at this. Also, we assume that Bluebeard was trying to cover his tracks a bit, and it is going to be harder if Prince Charming is in charge. Back to the woods outside Seattle. Bigby and Snow White, they get into their car, and they begin trying to drive away to get home. Bigby, he never learned how to drive, so Snow White has to do it. 
As Snow White is driving, their car tire pops because it was shot by Goldilocks with a gun from a far distance away. With their tire popped, Snow White loses control of their car and it drives right off a cliff and smashes through some trees onto the ground below. Back to Fable Town, we go to Sleeping Beauty's apartment, which Prince Charming has been staying at for now. Prince Charming goes into a private room he has there, and he releases the three small town fables that were caught spying. Prince Charming is actually the one that brought them down from the farm and hired them to do the spying mission for him. Prince Charming asks the three small town fables, now that we're away from prying eyes and ears, perhaps you three can explain why you were so inept as to get caught? The small town fables say that it wasn't their fault, they were overworked. Prince Charming asks where is Sergeant Wilfred? They tell Charming that Wilfred hasn't reported back in for a few days, they are beginning to get worried about him. Charming tells them alright, you three get some rest, no more jobs for a while. We'll need to curtail activity now that you've been discovered. I need to think about our next move. Back to Bigby and Snow White. They survived their car crash. The car absorbed most of the damage. Snow White is okay. Bigby, he does have a broken arm though. Bigby tells Snow, I'll be fine in a moment. It'll heal itself as soon as I change the wolf form, provided I set the bone first. I'll need your help. Snow White has to help Bigby set his bone right. She does so, and it hurts. Bigby screams a little from it. Bigby now has to change into his wolf form. He tells Snow White that someone is after them, a gunman of some sort. Snow White thought their tire earlier popped normally, but Bigby knows it was gunfire that popped their tire, sending them down the cliff. Bigby says, We'll need to move out fast. As soon as I change the wolf form, night or day, I can cover a lot of miles quickly, even with a passenger. Now, help me get undressed. You'll have to carry what's left of my clothes, as well as your stuff, if you want me to have something to wear once I change back. Bigby, now in wolf form, has Snow White ride him. He tells her, Hang on tight, Snow. You can't possibly hurt me. Goldilocks, she is the one hunting them. She phones Bluebeard. She tells Bluebeard that she did the job, that Bigby and Snow White are dead. She blasted their car off the cliff just two hours ago. Bluebeard complains, asking, Why did she even let them get to their car? Why didn't she kill them a few days earlier? Goldilocks explains, Look, I couldn't help letting them reach their car. It took me two frickin' days to find someone who would sell me a rifle without the three-day waiting period. Just this afternoon, I got up to their campsite, but they'd already left. Well, it's certainly not my fault. If you'd used a longer-lasting spell, they'd still be there waiting for me to walk up and shoot them at close range. After some arguing and some walking, eventually Goldilocks makes her way down to the crash site. She is trying to ensure they are in fact dead. Of course, when she gets there, she will realize they are not there. Up at Fable Town, Sergeant Wilfred, after his run-in with some real mice, had to battle them and fight them and kill them. This whole ordeal stopped him from reporting back to Prince Charming for a while longer. Back to Snow White and Bigby. They have now traveled quite a distance and are further away from Goldilocks for now. They have some time to relax and talk. Bigby says that they should try to get a few hours sleep. Snow White. She's done some thinking and she thinks about how back at their campsite there was only one tent and one sleeping bag. She says that they were probably sleeping together when they were under that trance enchantment. Bigby, trying to put Snow White at ease, tells her that he doubts it. He says, I saw plenty wolf tracks in the area about my size. I was probably running wild. Don't let it bother you. Snow White then accuses Bigby of saying, It's not my fault I'm overly concerned about what might have happened between us. Under the spell you caused, you're the one who confessed an interest in me. Bigby replies, After which you promptly shot me down. Now can we get some sleep? Snow White can't get over it. She asks Bigby, Why is he interested in her in the first place? Bigby, he tries to avoid the question, but Snow White demands to know. She says, Look, I can't sleep. I think I'm still too wired by today's events. 
So why, after several hundred years, are you suddenly attracted to me? Bigby answers, It's not all of a sudden. I don't act impulsively. You should know that by now. Bigby, he says that he will answer her question. Fables, issue 16, Storybook Love, part 3, Duel. Bigby is talking to Snow White, and he explains that among his people, on the wolf side of his family, his mother's side, the first stirrings of romance are usually triggered when they encounter someone that just smells right to them. Someone whose scent stands out from everyone else's. Bigby says he was always kind of into Snow White's scent, but he wasn't much interested in human girls back then when he first met her. It took centuries of him living as a human for that attraction to finally kick in, specifically to Snow White. He tells her, You're the woman I can't ignore. Living in the city, I have to smoke like a Bristol chimney just to deaden my senses enough to put up with the massive information overload. And even with that, I have to work hard to mentally filter out all the millions of intrusive sounds and scents. Every smoke belch and vehicle. Every single person with their natural smells, plus the different colognes and perfumes they drench themselves in. Every morsel of food served in 20,000 homes and restaurants, and every scrap of garbage they produce. I'd go crazy if I couldn't block it all out. But you and you alone, I can't block out no matter how hard I try, and believe me, I've tried. I know where you are every second of every day. I know if you're having good or bad dreams while you sleep. I know what kind of mood you're in by subtle changes in your natural musk. No matter how much you bathe or what manufactured scents you choose to wear. I know when you're happy, which is rare. When you're sad and when you're feeling desperately lonely, which is all too often. Snow White is a little weirded out because Bigby seems to know her so well. And she never realized. She says... All right, I think we should stop talking about this now. Bigby continues, though. He says, I know you get jealous when you have to talk to Beauty because of how successful her marriage has been. All things considered, how unrelentingly loyal Beast is to her. And you feel guilty for resenting her happiness and how that makes you snap at her, even though it's not her you're really angry with. Snow White says again, Stop it. This is too creepy. Like, you've been stalking me all these years. Bigby argues, Hey, if you recall, first few years in exile, I tried to live apart from you in the other fables, but you insisted I come to the new world to join your grand experiment. You should learn not to ask questions you can't stand to hear the answers to. Back to Fable Town. The small town fable spy, Sergeant Wilford, finally managed to report into Prince Charming and tell him everything. He told Prince Charming all about Goldilocks. He also reported on what he read in Bluebeard's diary, that Bluebeard is planning on killing Bigby. So, Prince Charming, he arrives at Bluebeard's apartment to confront him, and Prince Charming sent Hobbs away for the day. Prince Charming challenges Bluebeard to a duel to the death. Bluebeard is confused and asks why. Prince Charming says that all other things considered, I suppose I'm going to kill you as a favor to Snow. I've treated her so badly over the years that it's high time I do something to make up for it. I know you are planning on killing Bigby. For reasons that defy understanding, Snow seems to like that beast. Hell, she might actually be in love with him. Oh, don't go by how she treats him. She's been so relentlessly betrayed by everyone she's ever loved. She can't help but snap and snarl at a new love, but... Whatever the reason, she seems to want the old dog, so even though I find him personally distasteful, I can't allow you to kill him. Bluebeard, annoyed, says, fine, he will duel. He reminds Prince Charming about how they had a friendly fencing match earlier, and how he easily beat him. Prince Charming to this says, oh, I remember, but let's see if real blades and real danger make a difference this time, shall we? And with that, they touch swords, and begin sword fighting for real stakes this time, for their lives. Back to Bigby and Snow. Bigby smells that their assassin is a female, actually, not a man, as Bigby thought earlier. Snow White guesses that it is probably Goldilocks here to kill them. Bigby tells Snow White to 
hide under these boulders near. He is going to change into his wolf form and do a little blowing. He says, it's time for a bit of the old huff and puff. In Fable Town, Prince Charming and Bluebeard continue to duel. They are both getting sweaty and tired. Bluebeard offers Prince Charming money if he just lets him be. Bluebeard says, I'll shower you with as much as you can carry. Prince Charming replies, Silly man, you're not very quick on the uptake, are you? I intend to have all your riches as soon as you're out of the way. Noble impulses only go so far. Back to Bigby, now in his big bad wolf form. If you remember the Three Little Pigs story, the big bad wolf puffed and puffed and blew the pigs' houses down. Well, Bigby's mother was a wolf, but Bigby's father was apparently a man named Boreas Frostheart, better known by his other name, the North Wind. Wind gods are common in many human cultures and have a variety of forms and names. So Bigby's father is kind of a wind god in human form. And Bigby's father being the North Wind meant that Bigby inherited some of those wind powers and he can really blow some air. So Bigby right now, he huffs and he puffs and he blows with such force that the trees in the forest get sucked out of the ground from their roots and get blown about. Goldilocks, elsewhere in the forest, falls off her motorbike from all of the wind and the trees flying at her. Eventually, Bigby tells Snow White it is safe to come out now. Snow White is confused at Bigby's power. Snow White comments, Like everyone else, I heard the story about you and the three pigs, but I never imagined what you could really do. Bigby responds that he was actually still just a growing pup back then. He doubts now even a brick house could survive his blowing. Snow White asks if he killed Goldilocks by doing what he did. Bigby answers, No, unfortunately, but not for lack of trying. Killing her this way was a long shot. It wasn't my primary goal. But I've succeeded in two things. First, I've just created a trail pointing to us that an idiot couldn't miss. Goldilocks should have no trouble finding us now. And more important... I've just shown the local winds who's boss. They're obeying me now, for a while at least. Long enough that they'll maneuver to keep Goldilocks upwind of us at all times, carrying her scent directly to me, no matter what path she takes. Now I'll know where she is every second, right up until the moment she arrives. Prince Charming and Bluebeard continue dueling in Fable Town. Prince Charming, he starts winning their battle. He is getting some cuts into Bluebeard. Bluebeard tells Charming that, look, he wins. Bluebeard says he wants to surrender. Charming tells Bluebeard that surrender isn't an option. Prince Charming then stabs his sword right through Bluebeard's chest, killing him. Back to Bigby. Goldilocks tries to sneak up on him with her gun that she has. She tells him and Snow to show themselves. She knows they are here. Bigby, he then jumps out as a wolf and says, As you wish. Fables, issue 17. Storybook Love, part 4. Road Runner and Coyote Ugly. Goldilocks shoots Bigby with her rifle, and Bigby drops to the ground. Bigby tells Goldilocks, You should have used silver. Silver bullets, these... Steel and lead things hurt like the dickens, but they can't kill me or do anything permanent. My bones and vessels and guts are already knitting back together. I'll have you between my jaws soon enough. Goldilocks then shoots Bigby right in his mouth, feeding him some more bullets. Bigby goes down again, but like he said earlier, his body will just stitch itself back together. This was perhaps Bigby's plan all along to create a distraction because as Goldilocks is distracted with Bigby and trying to find ways to kill him, she thinks maybe she'll burn his body or something. Snow White sneaks up behind Goldilocks with an axe and slices into her skull. Goldilocks then stumbles. She slightly falls down and her glasses fall on the grass. But because Goldilocks is a semi-popular fable, she is still very resilient, and she is still managing to stay alive, despite the axe in her head. Snow picks up her cane, and she starts beating Goldilocks with it. 
Goldilocks, she eventually falls off a nearby cliff. She tumbles down some rocks down below. She rolls onto a nearby row. Despite this, though, Goldilocks is still alive. She stands up. She's slurring a bit. She says, I can take anything you can dish out. But then a huge truck hauling logs plows right into her. Goldilocks' body goes flying and she lands in a river. She is then presumed dead. Even though she is a very popular fable and she can withstand a lot, she most likely will not be able to withstand what she just went through. Bigby, now healing up a bit, asks Snow White, Did she go over the cliff? Is she dead? Snow White answers, Yes, definitely. Bigby replies, I hope so. She's a popular fable with the Mundies. They won't let her die easily. Bigby and Snow White then discuss what to do next. Bigby says, well, they should sleep for about two days and then go home. The next day, we jump over to Fable Town. Prince Charming has Bluebeard's body in a rug, and he is carrying the body pretty nonchalantly. Along the way, he comes across the fable known as Little Miss Muffet. You may remember her from the nursery rhyme that goes like this. Little Miss Muffet sat on a tuffet, eating her curds and whey. There came a big spider who sat down beside her and frightened Miss Muffet away. In the world of fables, Little Miss Muffet actually married that spider. I think Bill Willingham is having some fun here <laughs> by making her marry the spider. Well, she married the spider, and they opened a store called Web and Muffet. Little Miss Muffet has a reputation among the Fable Town residents as being the town's biggest gossip. Prince Charming, seeing her on the street, asks her, Good morning, Miss Muffet. How are you on this glorious day? Miss Muffet corrects Prince Charming and says, Her name is Miss Webb now. Her name is Webb because she married the spider in her story. She asks Charming, What does he got there? Prince Charming, he doesn't even try to hide it. He says, Oh, this? It's just a dead body. Nothing to worry yourself about. Do enjoy the day, Miss Webb. Prince Charming, he then walks through the Woodland Luxury Apartments, and he heads into the business office. Grimble, the security guard, and little boy Blue asks Prince Charming, What's he doing? Charming answers, Good morning, boy Blue. Ring the mayor and tell him that he'll want to come down here lickety-split. I got Bluebeard's corpse here. I murdered him yesterday, and now I'm going to dump him down the witching well to hide the evidence. I suspect King Cole will want to know why. Call him, you'll see. Now, what is this witching well that Prince Charming is talking about? The witching well is a magical well located in a chamber inside the Woodland Luxury Apartments building. It acts as a portal to the lands of the deceased and is used by Fable Town residents to dispose of Fable bodies on the assumption that they can't return. It is also used as a punitive measure for Fables responsible for committing a great crime. Dead Fables are committed to its depths as are most of the unredeemable criminals in Fable Town. No one is entirely sure what lies at the bottom of the Witching Well, nor indeed if it even has a bottom at all, but it is widely assumed to be the passage to the final resting place. About one hour later after Prince Charming dumped Bluebeard down the well, King Cole arrived. Prince Charming explained to King Cole his rationale for killing Bluebeard, and why it was a justified killing, and how they are all better off now. Prince Charming explains, He needed killing. Did you know he was holding back magical artifacts of tactical and strategic value in blatant contravention of Fabletown law? He has a bloody arsenal in that place of his, and I've barely begun to root out all of his hidey holes. King Cole argues, That's not the point. What happened to due process? You can't just take it upon yourself to kill our biggest annual contributor. King Cole, he's more so just worried about the money. Prince Charming replies, oh, that is your concern. Well, I've got good news for you, sir. No doubt certain he'd live forever, Bluebeard died without leaving a will. Therefore, all of his riches go directly to the Fable Town government. And he was loaded, far beyond anyone's imagination. You no longer have to bow and scrape to get his pittance of a handout every year. You get it all, every last penny, right now. King Cole, with dollar signs in his eyes, says, That is marvelous. King Cole is now all of a sudden okay with Bluebeard being murdered. King Cole says, Well, 
We should at least do an official hearing, of course. Strictly a formality, but best to do things correctly, Prince Charming says. And then I suggest we should have it now before Snow and Bigby return. You know they will try to drag things out, needlessly complicating everything. At the airport, Bigby and Snow White are finally on their way home. Snow White decides to address some of the things that Bigby told her in the forest, relating to how Bigby is interested in her. Snow White says to Bigby, You know, we really had to rely on each other for our lives out there, and we ended up saving each other. By any standard, we're closer now than we've ever been. I'm not the kind of woman to be flattered by someone who tricks me into going to a dance with him by claiming it will help solve my sister's murder. But if some straightforward nice guy were to ask me out to a dinner or a movie sometime next week or so, and he was willing to go very slowly, well, I sure wouldn't mind a night out among the Mondays once in a while. Bigby realizes that Snow White is giving him the green light to ask her out. She is interested in him. Bigby replies, Well, I'll be damned. Back in Fable Town, Prince Charming is making some moves. In Bluebeard's apartment, Prince Charming is talking to Hobbs, who is Bluebeard's manservant. Prince Charming tells Hobbs that he works for him now. Hobbs is actually happy to accept employ under Prince Charming, as he says, Prince Charming is a gentleman of breeding. Prince Charming wants Hobbs' help now to find out where Bluebeard's fortune is hidden, so that he can get his hands on it. Hobbs asks, isn't Bluebeard's fortune community property now? Prince Charming answers, yes it is, which means I'm just going to have to become the leader of the community. Prince Charming is planning now on running for mayor against King Cole. That way he can get access to all of Bluebeard's funds. Snow White, once she arrives home in Fable Town finally, she settles in. And in the coming days, she eventually gets a checkup by the local Fable Town chief doctor named Dr. Swinehart. Let me explain who Dr. Swinehart is. Dr. Swinehart comes from a fairy tale called The Three Army Surgeons. Those of you not familiar, the story is about three traveling army surgeons that perform surgery on themselves to impress an innkeeper. One of the surgeons cuts off his hand, one tears out his heart, and one cuts out his eyes. Dr. Swinehart, based on his name, we assume, is the doctor that tore out his heart. The doctors have a special ointment which apparently they can rub on themselves which allow them to reattach the severed body parts back together. However, the body parts in the story were stolen by a cat, and the girl working at the inn replaced them with animal body parts. Upon discovering this, the three surgeons threatened to burn down the inn they were staying in unless the innkeeper gave them a great deal of money. The innkeeper ended up paying them all off enough to retire. The surgeons, they still wanted their original organs back, but at least they got some money. So that is the origin story of Dr. Swinehart. In Fable Town, Dr. Swinehart is a fairly arrogant surgeon, often boasting about being the best field surgeon in the world. Dr. Swinehart, upon checking on Snow White, tells her that she is pregnant. Once the doctor leaves, Snow White phones Bigby and says, Bigby, get your traitorous ass up to my apartment in the next five minutes. I don't care if you're busy, move it or lose it. Apparently, when Bigby and Snow White were under that spell that Bluebeard put them under, the trance enchantment spell, and they were together camping for those few days. Well, at some point, they had intercourse, and Bigby is now the father of Snow White's future child in her belly. When they both came out of the spell, they had no recollection of what happened over those few days. However, with Bigby's superior senses, he probably was able to tell that something happened between the two of them. When Bigby finally does visit Snow White, Snow tells him the news that she is pregnant. Bigby seems happy about it. He's going to be a father. Snow White tells him, don't you dare be happy about this. You told me we didn't do anything. You said you slept outside the tent. Bigby replies, how would I know? I have no memories of the time we were both under the spell, do you? How does this become my fault? Maybe it was you who seduced me. Did you ever consider that? Snow White replies, 
You lied to me. You've got all those special senses you're always boasting about. So you would have known what we did as soon as we came to. But you hid it. Bigby does admit. Look, I told you what you needed to hear in order to stay calm and focused in a dangerous situation. He asks. So, what do we do now? Snow White tells him to go. She would like to be alone. Fables issue 18, Barley Corn Brides. This is the final issue in this volume. In this issue, we will learn a little bit more about those small town tiny people living up on the farm and what their deal is. In Fable Town, a little tiny man named Eddie Underfoot, who comes from Small Town, is sneaking around the Woodland Luxury Apartments building in their business office. Eddie is trying to steal himself a magic barley corn which can grow into a bride for him. He gets to where the magic barley corn jar is, but Buffkin manages to spot him and catch him before he can steal anything. Buffkin proudly brings Eddie to Bigby. Bigby inspects Eddie and comments, So it's Eddie Underfoot, down from the farm to make your try at the barley corns. The mouse police warned me you had come of age. Bigby, he is going to just give Eddie a warning and send him back to the farm, he says. You've had your one shot of fame and glory just like your old man when he turned 18 and his dad before him. Try it again and I'll have to charge you officially though. Once Eddie Underfoot is taken away, Flycatcher asks Bigby, why did he let Eddie off with just a warning when Bigby is always penalizing him for eating flies? Bigby explains, oh, this is a special situation. Every boy in small town tries to steal a magic barley corn once he comes of age. It's expected of them. A traditional rite of passage. Dating back to, well, it's a long story. Flycatcher, he wants to know that story. Bigby, he's in a happy mood today, so he decides, why not? He'll tell Flycatcher the tale of the barley corn brides. A long time ago in the homelands, there was an island called Lilliputin, which comes from the 1726 novel Gulliver's Travels, which was also adapted into a movie several times, most recently in 2010 with Jack Black. Gulliver's Travels tells the story of a man named Gulliver, who went on several adventures in strange lands, including Lilliputin, where people are tiny. So anyway, this story, though, is about those Lilliputians on their island where they are all small. When the war with the adversary started, the Lilliputians wanted to do their part. So they gathered up an army and sent a whole bunch of their little tiny people soldiers on a boat to foreign lands to help battle the adversary. When the Lilliputian soldiers finally crossed the sea, they arrived on land. On this land, though, everything was normal-sized to us, but to the Lilliputians, it was all really massive to them because they were so tiny. After exploring a bit, they determined that they were in a land of giants, and one enemy soldier could squish the lot of them under his boot. They can't help here, they can't battle the adversary. They decided that they should all just go home. However, when they returned to their boat, it was destroyed and burned. The Lilliputian soldiers saw an enemy soldier goblin lying on the ground, sleeping. They decided to intricately tie that goblin down to the ground, and then they questioned him for hours. The goblin soldier was pretty forthcoming, though. He explained, Our scouting party found this ship and wrecked it. My sergeant posted me here while they went off to find its miniature crew and he dispatched a runner to headquarters to report that somewhere out there there's a land of tiny folk who will be ridiculously easy to conquer. One squad of us could do it. The Lilliputian soldiers had to decide what they should do now. They can't stay here. More goblin soldiers will be back soon. They can't go back to their home either. I mean, one, their ship was destroyed, but also they risk leading the adversary's armies back to their homeland as Right now, the adversary does not know its exact location. So instead, these Lilliputian soldiers decided that they would have to find some place new to go. 
The soldiers traveled and wandered for months, staying far away from the adversaries' war. Eventually, they ran into some creatures who told them of a new magical sanctuary world, our world. The Lilliputian soldiers followed them. They followed them and left the homelands and ventured into our world along with the other fables. And once here, they went to go live up on the farm and they established a village called Small Town. There was a problem though in Small Town. The Lilliputian soldiers that fled the homelands and established Small Town were all male, as soldiers were all traditionally male back then and they left the women back at home. So there were no tiny little women here for them to procreate with. Years passed of this sausage fest, but eventually another fable from another story arrived. A little tiny female fable woman. Her name was Thumbelina. Let me explain a little bit about Thumbelina's original story as I was not super familiar with it myself. Originally published in 1835. In the story, there is a normal sized woman and she really wanted a child. So she went to a fairy witch to help, the good witch. The good witch gave the woman a magic barley corn seed from which she can grow a daughter. And she planted that magical kernel of barley corn in a flower pot. It grew into a tulip and Thumbelina sprang out of the tulip. And that is how she was born. Thumbelina was a very small size. I assume the size of a thumb. Eventually, Thumbelina got carried off by a toad who wanted Thumbelina to marry her toad son. Thumbelina escaped and was captured by a beetle who eventually abandoned her. Thumbelina was then taken in by a mouse, but the mouse eventually suggested that Thumbelina should marry her neighbor, who is a mole. Thumbelina did not want to marry the moles. She said no when she left. Thumbelina eventually met a fairy prince that was sort of was like human and small and tiny like her. And they married, and we assume they lived happily ever after for a while, anyway. Anyway, this version of Thumbelina in Fables arrived in Small Town, unmarried, maybe even a widow. She was brought to Small Town because she matched the size of all the other Small Town residents. All these Small Town male residents were very attracted to Thumbelina, and she was the only female in their entire town. However, they can't all marry and be with her. All the males of small towns started fighting each other for her attention. It was making everyone's lives miserable, including Thumbelina's. Something had to be done. Some proposed solutions were taken to King Cole. One of the solutions was to enchant everyone in small town to be normal sized. Or from now on, every woman who comes from the homelands should be shrunken down to their size and brought to small town. King Cole said that they can't afford either of those options. So they were out of luck for a while there. Eventually, one day though, Thumbelina was talking to some of the male residents of small town. And she told them the fantastic story of her birth. How her mother planted a kernel of a magic barley corn in a flower pot. And a tulip grew out of it. And she sprang out of the tulip blossom. Well, apparently, the good witch that gave Thumbelina's mother the magic barley corn also made it out of the homelands. The good witch was asked if the story was true, and if she had any more of these magic barley corns. The good witch said it was true, and she did have a whole jar of those barley corns, full to the top. But when she fled the homelands, she didn't bring them with her. She had too much to carry as it was. But she imagines that that jar of magic barley corns might still be back there in her cottage. Word of this got around small town, and eventually a young small town resident named Johnny Bullhorn got an idea. Johnny said he would return and venture into the homelands and retrieve the magic barley corns. And the bird, known as Commander Arrow of the Farms Air Patrol, volunteered to help Johnny on this mission. The people of Small Town were very supportive and gave Johnny many well wishes, and Johnny he then set off. Johnny and Commander Arrow ventured into the homelands, and they had many adventures there. Narrow escapes, bad weather, they avoided the adversary's occupational forces. A year went by, and Johnny and Commander Arrow had not yet returned home to Small Town. 
the people of small town assumed them dead and held a service for them. But Johnny and Arrow did continue on, and they did succeed in finding the good witch's cottage. But the place was completely wiped out. Nothing was here. Everything was taken. The adversary's army took it all. In that cottage, there was an insect named Mustard Pot Pete that lived in a mustard pot there. Pete was very friendly. They asked Pete about the magic barley corns, and Pete explained that the adversary's armies took it all to some big fortress up in the high hills, along with every other magical thing in this land. Us mere peons aren't allowed to own no magical stuff no more. Johnny and Arrow invited Mustard Pot Pete to come with them to go get this magic barley corn and then return with them to the farm. All three of them traveled to this fortress and entered through the entrance on the roof, and they found the room where all the magical items were being stored. The adversary's governor in this area left a magic bear named Mr. Grandors here to guard the items. But the bear was lazy and he could really care less if anybody took anything. They asked the bear where the magic barley corns are, and the bear told them that they would find those on the third shelf over there. They asked the bear if he planned on eating them. The bear answered, I'd never eat you. I'm accustomed to better cuisine than you'd provide. Actually, I'm a powerful sorcerer king. Well, an ex-king now. I'm supposed to turn intruders into frogs or porcelain statues or other things. So this magic bear was originally a human sorcerer named Mr. Grandors. After some pleasant conversation with this magic bear, they found the magic barley corn jar. They wondered, though, how they will carry this jar all the way back to their other world. The magic bear says that he thought he would come with them, and he would carry it, along with the three of them. Mr. Grandors, the magic bear, asked if Commander Arrow could be persuaded to lend him his wings for a few days. He said, I have no desire to serve the invaders, but at least in this job they left me alone for the most part, and until now I had nowhere else to go. I thought they'd already conquered every land. Well, this Mr. Grandors, this magic bear, magically borrowed Commander Arrow's wings and placed them on his own back. And then he flew them all home to the Fable Town farm. And when they arrived, they were all greeted warmly, and the barley corn seeds were planted, and they sprouted into tulips, and eventually into beautiful tiny woman, much like Thumbelina herself. In that first spring, when the magic barley corn sprouted into women, there were five couples that were united in weddings, the first of many to come. The magic bear gave Arrow his wings back and lived on the farm for a few centuries before getting a hankering to live down in the city. The magic bear transformed himself back into human form once again and became Mr. Grandors, who now lives up on the ninth floor of the Woodland Luxury Apartments. He will be showing up in the story in future volumes. Mustard Pot Pete found himself another mustard pot to move into. John Bullhorn, he became a legend, and from that day forward, he was now known as Johnny Barleycorn. He had many more adventures in the days to come, but those are tales for another time. Bigby, after explaining this story to Flycatcher, says, After that first crap, there were... More than enough women in small town to create more boys and girls the old-fashioned way. So, the jar of remaining barley corns was moved down here to be stored safely with the rest of our magical items. But, boys will be boys, and it quickly became a small town tradition for every young man to sneak down here and try at least once to win himself a barley corn bride before going home to marry the girl next door. Flycatcher asks why this is? And Bigby answered, Oh, many reasons, I guess. A desire to win status in the community by imitating what John Barleycorn did. And the Barleycorns are reputed to be far lovelier than any normal girl, their size or ours. With the tale now finished, Bigby tells Flycatcher, All right, you've had your story. We both have things to do. Flycatcher gets ready to go back to work. He tells Bigby, Thanks, Sheriff. You know, you're not nearly as mean as everyone says you. Bigby shoots him a mean look and Flycatcher stops himself and says, I'll get back to work now. And with that, we end Volume 3 of Fables. 
All right, that was Fables Volume 3. Let me go through my thoughts on the different story arcs we had in this volume. So the first issue was the Bag of Bones story, and I thought that was fun. It was like an adult fairy tale. I think Jack is a really amusing character, how he's such a jerk. He's always coming up with schemes. It was really funny how he wanted to get laid by this girl and came up with this whole way to, to, to get her to give in to that. <laughs> And uh, he used this magical sack to capture death, and there was many repercussions of that. So a uh, really amusing one-shot tale. The two-parter storyline involving the journalist thinking all the fables were vampires was amusing. I liked the kind of heist that went down where they went to the apartment building, had Sleeping Beauty put everyone to sleep, and then they raided this guy's apartment. And then when that didn't work, they subjected him to blackmail, and I thought it was amusing how they schemed to get him to. Uh, agree to their demands. Then we had the storybook love arc, which I thought was fun. We had Prince Charming battling Bluebeard to the death with a duel, and uh, Prince Charming won and killed Bluebeard in the end, so that was exciting. We had Snow White and Bigby getting together. Uh, there was a lots of them having conversations and them developing their relationship, which was great. I don't love how they were under the influence of this spell when they eventually did get together. I would have liked them to be more clear-headed with that, but still, it is nice to see them finally getting together in the end. And uh, their battle with Goldilocks was very fun, too. Uh, and Goldilocks appears to be dead, so uh, pretty exciting stuff. The final issue in this volume was the Barleycorn's Bride one, and I thought that was also very fun. Seeing these little small-town people and tying their story in with Thumbelina and seeing how that history played out was a really good time. So yeah, this was a solid volume. I'm going to give this one an 8.5 out of 10. Thank you all for watching. And I'll be back in the future with Volume 4 of Fables.